So our first reading of scripture today comes from the end of the book of Esther. We've been looking at the book of Esther over several weeks now. And routinely, if something is read from the book of Esther, it's from the middle of the book and not the end of the book. The end of the book describes events that led to the creation of the Jewish festival of Purim. Purim comes, takes its name from the act of casting dice by chance to choose and make a decision, and the casting of dice was called a pour. And so Purim came to be after an act of chance created a date chosen to do a genocide against the Jewish people, including Esther. But the end of the book, the end of the book of Esther, particularly the last three chapters, describes acts of violence and war. And so it's right that we hear and seek to understand this, as well as to see the larger story of God's faith through this word and through the rest of scripture. So this is a reading from Esther, verses in chapter 8 and chapter 9. In chapter 8, beginning with verse 9, it says, The king's secretaries were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, and summoned on the 23rd day. And an edict was written, according to all that Mordecai commanded, an edict to the Jews and to the satraps and the governors and the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to every province in its own script, to every people in its own language, and also to the Jews in their script and their language. By these letters, the king, the king Ahasuerus, allowed the Jews who were in every city to now assemble and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, with their children and women, and to plunder their goods on a single day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. In every province, in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict came, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a festival and a holiday. Furthermore, many of the people of the country professed to be Jews because of the fear, because the fear of the Jews had fallen upon them. So, pause for a second. So the king's first edict allowed all the Jews to be killed, destroyed, annihilated by the Persian people in the provinces. Because that edict couldn't be revoked, a second one was sent, allowing the Jews themselves to fight back and defend themselves. The element of farce is elevated even more in the next chapter, reading from chapter 9. Now the other Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives, and they gained relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them. But they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th day they rested and made that a day of feasting and gladness. And so letters were sent wishing peace and security to all the Jews, to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus, and giving orders that these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed seasons, as the Jew Mordecai and Queen Esther enjoined on the Jews, just as they laid down for themselves and for their descendants regulations concerning their fasts and their lamentations. The command of Queen Esther fixed these practices of Purim, and it was recorded in writing. Pause. So Purim still exists today. It is an annual festival. And it's sometimes celebrated on two different days. And so many of the scholars assume this description of two days of fighting and a day of festival are how they explain why Purim is celebrated on different days historically through the centuries. Many scholars do not take the literal death of 75,000 people as a reality, but it still is there in the passage. So whether this was an actual event or simply a storytelling device, we need to seek God's wisdom and grace in understanding God's word for us today. So friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So paired with the reading from the end of the book of Esther are these words from the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus, a reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Paul writes, 
But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For Christ is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. Let us pray. Gracious God, once more draw near to us. Guide us through your words, your history, your present grace, your future hope. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So Esther, the book of Esther, is a Bible story that is truthfully more story than Bible. And the end of Esther is part of the story that we hear the least about for good reason. As I mentioned, the evil advisor, Haman, had set in motion a genocide against all the Jewish people living in those Persian provinces. His edicts, once they were ratified by the king, could not be revoked or changed. And so the king decided to let all the Jews fight back if they were attacked and to take revenge on their enemies for at least two days in a month chosen by poor, by chance. The annual Jewish festival of Purim then is a time to remember that moment when the tables were turned, when the oppressed were able to fight back against their oppressors. Now how Purim is celebrated today actually tells us a lot about how the entire story of Esther should be interpreted. Purim, if we're honest, today is a crazy carnival of costumes and noisemakers, of play acting and food eating and gift giving. It's a fanciful, farcical festival. And so we read the book of Esther in light of Purim and pull out where it is fanciful, even farcical. A king's edicts can't be revoked, so he writes a new edict saying that all the victims can now freely retaliate. That's a joke. And then, as it unfolds, the king is excited to learn of reports of slaughter in his own land totaling 75,000 dead. No, don't make me laugh. But this still remains a story of reversals and of violence in the Bible. We can't just walk away from it. Now, maybe the entire book is designed as a whimsical way to tell how this two-day festival came to be, set in motion by Esther and Mordecai. But in the end, the way this story is told tells something about us. And particularly, it says something about how we talk about war and violence even today. So I checked some Jewish scholars, and I wanted to see how did they deal with these last chapters to the book of Esther. Many of these scholars point further back in the Old Testament, and they tell about the time when Moses was leading the Jewish people out of Egypt. And while they were weak and vulnerable, they were attacked by the Amalekites in an unprovoked raid. Now, by God's grace, the Jewish people were able to fend off the Amalekites, but historically, the Amalekites had become the standard bearers of enemies of the Jews. They became the archetypal enemies of the people of God. And then the scholars will note that Haman is of the family and the lineage of the Amalekites. And so therefore, the whole story is simply this involved reminder of a time of a plot to kill the Jews that was broken by God's will and by Mordecai and Esther, and Purim was established as a remembrance. The scholars didn't condone the violence of Purim. They simply saw it as part of this larger fictional story of ancient reversals. And the Christian scholars I read about the book also noted that in light of our own faith traditions of anti-Semitism and genocide, we should be very cautious before using the Purim story to ascribe violent tendencies to Esther and Mordecai's people. And all of that is true. 
But having said that, there is no getting around the discomfortable language there at the end of Esther. Language about war, about slaughter, about loss of life. We've, we've heard so much about war over the last century. We've seen so many images even today. Must we deal with it in church? Must we somehow once more hear stories of war from the Bible? And here's the challenge we face. Or I'll speak personally. Here's the challenge I face. If I stand up here and I announce to you all as people of faith, we worship Christ, the Prince of Peace. We profess, blessed are the peacemakers. We long for a day when the lion will lay down with the lamb and when swords are beaten into plowshares. Likely all of you would nod in agreement with those familiar phrases. But if I stood up here and I said, as a people of faith, we need to denounce all wars, especially America's militarism. We need to challenge the exorbitant budgets given for defense allocations. And we need to stop idolatrous worship of soldiers and violence. By saying that, I would probably get some eye rolls and likely a few emails in tomorrow's inbox. For approximately the first 300 years of the Christian church, we were unanimously pacifists. A Roman church leader named Hippolytus wrote that no man could be baptized a Christian if he also served in the Roman army. And displaying military ambitions was a reason for the early church leaders to actually refuse baptism. The church father Origen argued that no Christian should ever pick up a sword. And when he got into an argument with a secular scholar named Celsus, who was worried that this spread of Christian pacifism would put the Roman Empire at risk, Origen replied, well, if the world became Christian, you wouldn't need the army in the first place. But all that changed in the year 312, when Constantine, through a vision, chose to make Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire. And Christian pacifism crumbled after drinking the heady wine of imperial power. By the year 416, in effect, you had to be a Christian to serve in the Roman army. We moved from following the Prince of Peace to seeing Jesus as the Lord of War. We moved from catacombs to crusades. And sadly, the language of war and violence and revenge and destruction has been articulated on pious lips for centuries since. Someone once said, give a small boy a hammer and he will find that everything needs pounding. It's like the old saying, to a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, to a person with a gun, everything looks like a target. Basically, one of the causes of war is war itself. Wars produce warlike societies, which in turn make the world more dangerous for other societies because they are forced to adopt the same perspectives and warlike tendencies. War begets war and it corrupts human society along the way. Karl von Clausewitz, who is probably the greatest writer on the theory and nature of war, himself said that war is essentially irrational. It's not accidentally so, it's not on the edges, but at its very core, it is irrational. To train young men and women to kill is an irrational act just as it's irrational to believe that we could ever win the hearts and minds of any nation while aiming a gun at their heads or their children's heads. Now, it's usually at this point in a discussion on this topic, someone will say, well, what do you want us to do? Put down our weapons and let the world run over us? They have guns, and so we have to have guns, and hopefully bigger ones. But see, that argument is the epitome of the war begets war school of thought. Instead of that approach, 
take a deep breath and ask yourself, who profits from the sale of guns and military equipment around the world? And must we make money in that way, or is there a better way? And why do we assume the military budget should increase every year while education and health services and anti-poverty programs face annual cuts? Isn't there a better way? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said point blank to the disciples, is there anyone among you who if your child asked for a bread, you would give them a stone? Or if the child asked for a fish, you would give them a snake? We'll paraphrase those verses. If a child anywhere asks for bread, why would you hand them a gun? And if they ask for fish, why are you doing that with a weapon? Must we be people of war? Wouldn't a better way involve being people of peace, of compassion, of medicine, of food, of grace, of faith? There was a newspaper writer who recently attended a ceremony in a small chapel at the VA hospital in Philadelphia. And there was a group of veterans there who had gathered to talk about the moral injuries they carried within them after serving in active duty overseas. And one veteran sobbed while telling about an airstrike that he had called in that ended up killing literally dozens of civilians. And after those veterans spoke, the congregation in that chapel formed a circle around them, and they linked their arms, and they said together, we put you into situations where atrocities were possible. We share responsibility with you for all that you have seen, for all that you have done, for all that you have failed to do. It must be said, more than any other nation, Americans live disconnected from the brutality of war. War's violence is something that happens over there to someone else. Even our returning veterans with their scars and PTSD are mostly kept out of sight and out of mind. There must be a better way, a more faithful way. John F. Kennedy was once corresponding with a friend in the active duty of the Navy. And Kennedy said that war will exist until the day when the conscientious objector uh, enjoys the same reputation and the same prestige as the warrior does today. And that's the paradox of Purim. It's a story of reversals. It's a fable that's become an annual festival for a people long persecuted, allowing them to remember a time when the tables were turned as they dance and dress up and role play. But it's also a story that contains painful language of organized violence, of war and death and retribution. We can't simply remove those last chapters from that part of the Bible, but we can insist there is a better way. We must stop allowing the language of war and violence to define how we live as one human family under God. We will not accept stories of warfare, even in the Bible, as being inevitable or somehow God-sanctioned. We have seen that all war invariably escalates from the blitzkrieg in London to the firebombing of Dresden to the nuclear waste of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And war not only harms our brothers and sisters today, it makes it almost impossible to live with them peacefully tomorrow. As Christians, we must persistently show a bias for peace. It is not an equal equation. It's not the conscientious objector who must justify themselves, but the war room generals. Because war is never inevitable. It is mostly a failure of imagination and a weakness of spirit. And it's an affront to all who follow Christ.
Now soon we're going to share the communion meal. And the language of the communion meal speaks of Jesus' own tragic death. A shedding of His blood and a body broken by those in power. We share that bread for one simple reason. That we might live at peace. That we might find peace. And the communion table was never meant just to feed us. It was always meant for the world. So may we be biased for peace. And may we do all we can so that we can live, literally live. Because such is the will of the one who died and rose again. Such is the will of Jesus the Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen.